My question is about, about time. Most of the predictions that we see, particularly on the SDGs, suggest that we're not headed in the right direction or we're not going to achieve them on time. What, what are the prospects that you see moving forward uh, in terms of particularly, uh, with, I mean, climate change is, the, is obviously the burning issue, but, but I think there are many linked issues there. So what, what are our prospects of actually saving humanity today? So the SDGs uh, are aimed at 2030. Uh, if you are a, a betting person, don't bet on their achievement. Uh, we're, they are definitely very long odds. I always ask, are they technically achievable? And probably just barely at this point, because uh, they used to have a 15 year time horizon. We didn't do very much in the first uh, four years, then came COVID. Uh, that's a huge setback. We have nine years left. It would be extremely hard to meet these even uh, under the best of circumstances right now. Not completely impossible, but it would require a massive social and political and economic uh, mobilization to do so. Uh, climate change is a little bit different because it's uh, it cannot be achieved uh, climate safety by 2030. The time horizon is really to 2050 to decarbonize. That's feasible. That's still 29 years away. Uh, we could do that. We could really decarbonize the energy system at least 80% without breaking a sweat, 90% with some real effort, and even 100% if it were a national and global mission uh, by mid-century. We're not on track for any of this. When the SDGs were announced, nothing happened afterwards globally, I can tell you. You know, I'm involved in this day to day, hour to hour. Of course, the only thing that happened was Trump became president. Uh, Trump, Trump was the worst president in American history by far, uh, with the possible exception of James Buchanan, who really does deserve uh, to be paired with Trump because he really was a disaster. Uh, but the two of them are the worst that we ever had. And the United States was you know, not only not doing anything, it was running exactly in the wrong direction. Interestingly, with the President Biden, who I like a lot, I haven't heard the word sustainable development goals yet from the administration, from any single official. I don't know if they're aware of them. Uh, I'm going to try to break the news to them uh, that they exist uh, sometime soon. Uh, so, but at least he's moving in the right direction. And he's a very nice man, uh, the president. I know him for 30 years, a uh, very decent man. Um, so this is much better, but there is no global mobilization. And so it's very, very hard. Uh, I look at all that wealth, all the technology we have, all the digital potential, everything. We could meet the goals or come very close to doing so, but it would take a mindset that we simply don't have right now. I want to fight for it. I want to use the pressure. I want to use the reality of nine years. The one good thing about the sustainable development goals that's crucial for us is that they are globally agreed. They are every day. I speak with five governments, I would say, about them in some part of the world. They are actually incorporated into public policies but not in the sense of taking them seriously as time-bound objectives needing financing, but as normative ideas about the direction to go. So they're playing a constructive role, but we are not on track in any way to achieve them. Thank you. Jeff, it's 1220. Do yeah, you have maybe time one, for one more question, question, then I'm gonna okay. dash out the door. <laughs> okay, Ron, Ron, you have the last question. Uh, Jeff, I, I couldn't be have we've met, uh, uh, we're, we've been building this program at uh, Presidio Graduate School around economics, and I couldn't be happier that you've moved to moral philosophy. And no, that's- I, I feel the same way, thank you. <laughs> well, but, but have you looked at all in, because uh, uh, Locke's famous line was life, liberty, and property. 
Jefferson said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, yeah. which changes everything. Have you looked at all into Jefferson's education uh, by the moral philosophers of the Scottish Enlightenment? They were all, you know, Adam Smith, people say, well, Ron, your degrees in moral philosophy, what's that got to do with economics? I say, what chair did Adam Smith hold at Glasgow? Of course. So yeah. have, yeah. You looked, have you looked at that line of thought? Because I think that's a major idea because pursuit of happiness in essence was eudonomia working in community. That is absolutely correct. Uh, and uh, we, we got happiness back onto the agenda, which is uh, extremely important. So I agree completely with that. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a lover of Adam Smith in a lot of ways, but I'm grappling with him uh, in real time. For, first, I think, uh, and I have many uh, uh, different points, so I would like a, a few hours with you to talk about it, uh, and, and maybe we'll find, find that time. Um, but there's one thing that troubles me, really troubles me, uh, about uh, the wealth of nations. Uh, and that is uh, the invisible hand, uh, of course, was actually a term of use in the 17th and 18th century. And it meant that God's will had you know, created uh, a, a beneficent universe. Uh, and the invisible hand was taken, only mentioned once uh, in uh, the wealth of nations, but taken by Smith uh, as a reasonable metaphor. And the truth is in The Wealth of Nations, so it's a magnificent book and very humane and with incredible decency, there's a complacency that really is there in The Wealth of Nations also. There's no discussion of poverty by, by Smith uh, that uh, is, uh, recognizes these issues. And Smith held the interesting view that he expresses both in the theory of moral sentiments and in the wealth of nations that, you know, rich people have to spend. So they spend on their trifles and their trinkets, and that's how they respread their, their wealth out. So in the end, the, uh, the, the mechanics and, and the artisans and so forth end up getting a decent uh, standard of living. It's, it's kind of ingenious, but it does not have the moral urgency of poverty. Yeah. And, and I think this is my only knock on Smith, that he left a sense of complacency. Uh, and and uh, the invisible hand was a message about uh, a beneficent economic system that in the end would come out all right. And it doesn't come out all right, except if we put the visible hand in there too. Yeah. Well, thank you. My only response quickly would be that you've got to interweave the theory of moral sentiments, which he revised five times. Yeah. And, and he finally added section seven on a system of moral, a, a system of moral philosophy. Oh, I, okay. I, that I'm not even aware of. So I need to uh, make sure that I understand and, that. And that's what he was, just as you have, you're an example of a modern Adam Smith tumbling to this idea of a moral system. And that's wonderful. He, Ron, I will come back to that. Good, Everybody, thanks. I would love if we can find ways to continue the discussion. It's extremely gratifying for me. Uh, I'm most grateful. I'm so sorry that I do have to, uh, to, to run right now. But thanks, Tony, so much yeah. for inviting me. Thanks to all of the colleagues. Uh, thanks to Fordham for letting me uh, and Tony teach uh, this semester. It's uh, incredibly exciting. So I'm really grateful for that. Right. Okay, thanks, right. Jeff, Bye. and Bye -bye. thanks everybody for for joining this talk today. Um, it was really good. Um, I think every, I think it was uh, extremely enlightening to hear Jeff talk about these topics. So thank you very much, and have a good rest of your day, everybody, wherever you're from, thanks. wherever yeah. you're coming from. Take care.